Hi, welcome to the third edition of the Aragonese podcast, what we have called the ePod. Among the things we do is to host events, and in today's episode, we will revisit an event we had recently, a launch uh, of a collection of poems by the famous philosopher Christopher Norris on our imprint, Utopos Publishing. The collection is called Damaged Life Poems After Adorno's Minima Moralia. Adorno was a very important critical theorist who escaped from Germany in the 1930s, lived in America for a while and then relocated to Frankfurt and became the founder of what we know as the Frankfurt School. In this book, Minima Moralia, there are some cryptic passages with a highly condensed and on occasion strikingly poetic prose. What Chris does is to write formal verse that elaborates or in some way responds to some of these passages from the book. Chris is uh, Emeritus Professor in Philosophy at the University of Cardiff, and he is the author of many books of philosophy, literary theory, music, history of ideas, and recently he has started writing poetry in formal verse, and this is his latest collection, Damaged Life. At the launch event for the book in December, Chris discussed and read from the collection. Enjoy the readings. First, I'll read you um, yeah, a, a short piece, a short um, a fragment of, um, from, from Minima Moralia by Adorno. It's called Second Harvest, this part of the book. What he says is, um, every work is an uncommitted crime. Uh, and that connects with lots of other um, quite well-known sayings in Adorno, um, um, or, or for that matter, Benjamin. They're very close in, in this respect. Um, that every monument of Benjamin's um, uh, dictum, really, that there, every monument of culture is also a monument of barbarism. Um, in other words, the work of art may appear very um, perfect and self-contained and aesthetic and quite detached from politics, but it's been achieved through uh, the labor or the suffering of the millions. Um, so, but a longer piece, this is not from Minimum Raleigh, or it's from Notes uh, to Literature, Adorno's collection of essays on literary themes. He says, um, Adorno says, however little doubt there is about the Brechtian tone and its unmistakable quality, the tone is poisoned by the falseness of its politics. His lyrical voice has to make itself gravelly to do the job better, and it grates. The rough and tumble adolescent masculinity of the young Brecht already betrays the false courage of the intellectual who, out of despair about violence, short-sightedly goes over to a violent praxis of which he has every reason to be afraid. So um, Adorno is taking issue with uh, Brecht. He's saying that Brecht is impulsive, that he is uh, launching into action without adequate thought, and that he is misleading um, the youth of his time. Um, um, into dangerous, perilous, and deeply ambivalent, um, potentially very violent politics. So it's a, it's a pretty deep quarrel between them. Um, there's a famous poem of Brecht, which I also quote here. If we could learn to look instead of gawking, we'd see the horror in the heart of farce. If only we could act instead of talking, we wouldn't always end up on our ass. That's from the resistible rise of Arturo Ui, Brecht's play. Okay, so the, the first poem is Brecht to Adorno, and they alternate after that, Brecht to Adorno, Adorno to Brecht, etc. Brecht to Adorno. Each work of crime unacted, so you say, and try your best to make it stick. That overstated case, by switching thought tracks double quick, pursuing arcane points the longest way around, and using every trick in theory's book to face them down, those critics out to prick your gloom balloon and tweak your passion play. Yes, we know all about them, painters quick to flatter tyrants, songsmiths base enough to take the pay of monsters, poets who'd embrace the foulest kind of body politic, where fame or fortune spur the chase, or canny types who will lay their bets in any patron race on selling out so swine can take their pick. By all means, chalk these up to art's disgrace, but then let other types defray the cost like Bolshevik composers itching to convey the new Red Dawn, or poets who'd still place class politics above the sway of power that bids they lick the boot of any latter-day dictator out to grab more living space. And so it goes on. Um, I'll read you just a couple of stanzas from the first Adorno response, okay? So this is Adorno to Brecht. Point taken, but your case, 
and let's not duck the issue. Your own poems show me right, show me right, since they reveal what ways around we have to go and pluck, and no, sorry, what ways around we have to go if we're to learn from history and pluck from for past defeats the gift to know when any brusque appeal to man the barricades must blow our chances like a bargain too soon struck. Likewise agreed, art is the overflow of private feelings can't conceal its poverty or luck out always on the lyric deal that lets it tweak the wish truth ratio as love desires when what we feel may just turn out to buck the consequential trend and steal a march on those at home on truth's plateau so it's um it's adorno really taking the negative dialectical line and the saying examine your um your intentions your will your presuppositions your historical understanding your sense of future possibility and don't act don't encourage others to act before you have thought through the consequences so it's 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 a sort of classic debate and it was one that that loomed throughout adorno's career uh, he was constantly um denounced by people on the left on the activist um left by paying too much attention to the subtleties of the dialectic by um by discouraging, well, this happened later on in his career. It, you might say it killed him in the end because um, during the, the student uprising in Germany um, in the, uh, the late 60s, 70s, um, he took exactly this line. He said it was premature to be out on the streets already. They hadn't thought out their position. They were going to suffer defeat and that defeat would um, take down any, any hopes for a social improvement or, or for revolution um, in Germany for, for decades. Um, so again, he, he took this this uh, this line, um, which they saw as, as treachery. Here is a man of the left who is now telling us not to go out and protest government violence and so forth. Um, and um, he he became very um, very steamed up, very angry, very resentful, felt he'd been misunderstood. And eventually, students protested in one of his his lectures. In fact, some women went forward, went up um, bare chested. And he, um, in his way, a rather, um, not a stuffy bourgeois professor, but at least, um, you know, fairly conservative in his social habits, was um, outraged, appalled and uh, by this and uh, died of a heart attack just a couple of days later. So it had a, a tragic outcome. But it was the story of his life, really, um, to, to find himself pushed into a position that he, he himself found unpalatable, appearing to be um uh, discouraging people from taking radical action but doing so out of what he felt was a sense of historical responsibility so that's how the poem goes on um tall guy did you want to take up the story at that point uh, it's, it's just really fascinating to, to hear you contextualize it this way uh, you know so it's great to just hear your uh, explication but you know what is so striking about it is it's very it's, you know uh, clear these divisions right that you set up in this poem and, uh, you know, from Adorno's perspective, what Best is um, promoting is a false, it's a false politics. Yeah. It's a what, a what? You, you use the term false. It's a false politics. Yeah. I mean, hmm. it's misguided. It is not uh, strategically uh, unwise, but it's false. You know, this, this is an incredibly uh, strong characterization of your opponent, right? Um, and it seems like, you know, we are working with two sides here where, at least from Adorno's perspective, the Bastian side sort of peddles this identity marker, yeah? We, you know, we are the ones who will, you know, make this happen, make the revolution happen. We will mend the barricades, we will do it. We are, you know, a group, uh, uh, you know, a social cohesive unit. Whereas Adorno takes the point of, of the strategic uh, thinker, yeah, who says that this will has to have to last through the time when the state sweeps us away, right? When the the state will win, and we have to be there afterwards. Yeah. So he has he has a strategic, a longer perspective. But what I, I find extremely fascinating here is that what you seem to be um, explicating in this poem is also a poetic, right? Uh, do not let your art overflow with pr private feeling is this uh, adorno the poet who is speaking through you uh, chris mm. i suppose so he he's very hard on um i mean the, the, yeah brecht has some very unflattering things to say about lyric poets 
yeah, basically he says, you know, forget your Rilke and take up your Heine, um, Heine's socialist poets, his activist poems. And um, yeah, but um, Adorno, Adorno also has some pretty um, uh, catty things to say about some lyric poets, 19th century lyric poets in Minima Moralia. Um, on the other hand, um, he's equally hard on, um, on poets of, well, poets like Brecht, um, who want to use poetry as a form of direct um, encouragement to action, to get people out onto the streets. So he would have, um, yeah, he'd have regarded that as premature and damaging to the left, to, to any sort of properly thought out left wing politics. Um, so he's treading a very narrow and very, um, very difficult path, really, between what he sees as opposed temptations. On the one hand, the escape into a kind of soulful first person confessional lyrical self-absorption. But on the other hand, um, um, the kind of activism, um, artistic activism that he finds crude and um, insufficiently um, thought out. Yeah. Yeah. And as always, he got brickbats from both sides, which again is the story of Adorno's career. You know, it would be tempting, you know, to take sort of the the, the advocate of best side here and say that, uh, well, maybe it uh, was easier for Adorno because, you know, in a way he escaped that destiny. Yeah? He, you know, I mean, if you're saying like best, he went back, he supported dictators, he went to the DDR, you know, he became uh, a, a stooge for, you know, this new totalitarian socialism that rose in, in Eastern Europe. But Adorno didn't have to, to make that choice, right? He stayed and he drank uh, long drinks on, uh, on the beaches of California. I, I, you know, this is a bit, uh, bit harsh, but I mean, would it be possible to say that? It, you know, it, it's, it's, it was just easier that way for Adorno to sit back and, and criticize. Yeah. Well, both of them, Brecht and Adorno, got criticised, got attacked, in fact, um, for um, what were seen as different kinds of evasion, I suppose, yeah. Yes, I mean, Brecht, um, to be fair, Brecht took some risks in East Germany. I mean, he often came out against the government, and he was certainly perceived by the government as a thorn in their flesh. Yeah, uh, he was too, um, too widely known, too respected, well, not respected, but well known, at least, yeah. So, and uh, I mean, Brecht was first to confess his own failings too, um, in his personal life as well as his political life. But uh, yes, yeah, certainly it was often said of Adorno that um, he had, once he got out of Germany, having you know um, obviously um, suffered extreme risk in Germany, um, that he had a fairly comfortable life in, in California. But um, yes, you could say that, I suppose. But then um, if you accept his basic premise, which is that ideas have enormous historical influence, um, for better or worse, and that if you're going to launch ideas on the world in whatever form, whether it be poetry or philosophy, there would better be good ideas and ideas that have stood the test of, uh, well, a good dialectical testing, if you like, um, then um, you wouldn't see anything particularly discreditable about spending a long time thinking very hard, um, wherever you're doing that thinking. And that was his objection to Brecht, not enough thinking, too many calls to action. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I would just encourage everyone here to, uh, to get the book and, and read it. It's, it's very interesting stuff. And it's a very fresh perspective, actually, on, on many of these uh, debates that's been going for a while. So, Chris, I'm going to leave, uh, leave the microphone to you now. If you want to, to read or if you want to interact with the audience, uh, please feel free. OK. I'll read a few more and talk about them as we um, as we go along. Yeah, uh, this is an example of um, the the personal side of minimum moralia. Um, as I said, there are some uh, passages in the book, um, and the book, by the way, is made up of um, short um, short pieces, like uh, mini essays, really. Uh, some of them only. Um, ooh, uh, 10 or 12 lines long, um, some of them shorter than that even, some of them a couple of pages, um, but to all of them to a degree self-contained, but the more you look at them and the relationship between them, if you read the book, um, I mean, it's designed to be dipped into, if you like, or to be read straight through, and then you get some sense of chronology. Um, but there is a musical organization there. And one of the most important things about Adorno is the fact that as well as a literary critic, a philosopher, a dialectician, 
um, a thinker, if you like. He was also um, a music critic, a composer. Um, his, his, some of his music, what I've heard at least, is surprisingly uh, traditionalist, really, traditional forms. Um, but uh, he was acquainted with Schoenberg. He wrote a lot of um, analytic criticism. Um, and um, he, he wrote many books on music, on Wagner, on Mahler, a very beautiful book on Mahler, and a book called Philosophy of New Music, which was highly controversial. Um, and these things were not separate in his life. Um, there's a kind of musical organization, both at the local level, if you like, the micro level, within the individual um, um, entries in this book, um, and at the, 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 longer the larger level. So alongside the dialectics, uh, alongside this, as I said, intensely dialectical habit of thought, there is also a kind of musicality about his prose. And I suppose that was partly what um, what prompted me to, to have this rather strange idea of, uh, of versifying Adorno. And this is one of those very beautiful pieces that brings out his, um, his love of, um, of music and his memory, by the way, of his mother playing the piano and the singing. And his musical education, his early musical experience, was very typical um, German bourgeois um, um, music, um, the tradition, especially Brahms. He loved Brahms. So this is a piece called Little Nails. Um, and he says, this, this is a bit that I quote from Minima Moralia. He says, my earliest memory of Brahms is Cradle Song. Complete misunderstanding of the text. I did not know that the word used there for carnations, nagline, referred to flowers, but took it to mean the little nails, drawing pins, with which the curtain around my cot was thickly studded, so that the child, shielded from every chink of light, could sleep in unending peace without fear. Nothing for us can fill the place of undiminished brightness except the unconscious dark. So um, that little twist in the tale there. Um, but I mean, what you have there on the face of it is a charge of memory, nostalgic, and this sort of dream of really kind of the, the bliss of, um, of uh, safety and security in the mother's womb. Um, but then the, uh, that, 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 um, that very, very personal final sentence. Um, so, from child to adult, error holds its charms. No flower to match those curtain pins or vie with them for power to ward off darkest fears by shielding me <clears throat> from daylight wakefulness. No music conjures childhood quite like Brahms. No other piece quite like his lullaby for fears and joys relived across the years and threats held off till curse should turn to bless. Still we hear safety in the voice that calms, the mother's song, the words that satisfy our adult need when some new threat appears to raise the spectre of that old distress. Yet who shall say what real or fancied harms once loomed beyond the curtain, where I'd lie half wakened and half knowing its frontiers would yield should day fears wrench and repossess. Why say a thinker's care or scholar's qualms must have been now make light of that which I once found through ignorance could stem my tears and wind me close in Brahms's song caress. Cradle and song stand in for mother's arms, that's clear, though weary exiles may ask why the metonymic chain so often veers off course to mark them down no fixed address. For there's no end to real and false alarms, to pogroms signalled by distant cry, or rumoured savageries that reach our ears despite the music's call, regress, regress. Then infant lullabies turn adult balms, those lifelong cradle substitutes that try each time to rearrange all souvenirs of how each time the comfort yield grew less. So it's um it's all the more moving really in Adorno when you get these um these these almost plangent um, sort of appeals to childhood and to memory as a kind of place of refuge, um, sort of looking back over the years of well his exile in a place that he found deeply alien and discomforting. And uh, the the terrors of the um, of the 1930s in Germany and his childhood farther back, and then you get these uh, sudden um, uh, sort of focusings on an intensely personal memory. Um, this is another um, piece that makes the the musical connection. It's called Magic Flute, um, and the passage from um, Minima Moralia that uh, uh, inspired it goes like this. 
As radiant things give up their magic claims, renounced the power with which the subject invested them and hoped with their help himself to wield, they become transformed into images of gentleness, promises of a happiness cured of domination over nature. That's a passage actually called Magic Food. They held you spellbound once, the jewels you sought and coveted, then hoarded till the sight that held you captive threatened to distort your every sense modality, to blight your life world by their radiance, and thwart, like scenes repressed but harshly dragged to light, your wish to have them not so dearly bought, since touched by art's fine gift to put things right. Listening to Mozart, we have little thought of what old savageries are taking flight in such beguiding melodies. What sort of half-remembered horrors may affright the ear and mind, less adequately taught to filter out those overtones that might subdue our weak defences? They exhort, make no mistake, it's his Queen of the Night wins Mozart's verdict in the only court that counts, the one where rival parties fight it out between them, and the bloody sport is waged each time on art's delusive, uh, delusive height. My point in brief, it took pain dure refort, the torturer's technique, to, dame, to tame those bright jewel treasuries whose gleam might else abort whatever signs of progress we could cite, against the evidence of lives cut short by avarice, or man's dark appetite for every fetish object finally wrought to conjure bloodlust in its acolyte. How then appease the jewel-clad juggernaut, if not by art's veiled promise to requite the ancient cravings of a creature caught like Lucifer in dark bedazzled plight. Um, the, um, one way I, I justify the, the, the use of uh, rhyming verse, in, I, I wouldn't want to um, make to excuse it generally. I think there are all kinds of um, potentialities in rhyme. I, this, I'm speaking about um, what I call functional rhyme. I mean, there's decorative rhyme and there's musical rhyme and there's nice sounding rhyme and uh, there's mnemonic rhyme for that matter, you know, like the um, days in the month and so forth. But um, I think that um, other uses of rhyme um, can be semantically complex and the use of rhyme can do something like the equivalent of what Adorno does. Um, Adorno's negative dialectic. By choosing a complex rhyme scheme and um, to use his word, an exigent um, um, stanza form, you can put yourself into some pretty tight corners and you can uh, discover words um, that, that are, if you like, forced on you by the rhyme scheme, but at the same time strike you as soon as they come to mind as having a relation to the theme of the poem and the point you've reached in the poem um, that is quite illuminating, that can be revelatory. And this has to do with, with etymology. It has to do with etymological echoes and connections, analogies and metaphorical um, associations too. But uh, I find rhyme is, is liberating. I find um, free verse doesn't provide that kind of satisfaction. And I think in Adorno's case, um, I hope I'm not inventing a post hoc rationalization here. Um, but in Adorno, you get the same kind of um, willingness to take long range risks in his dialectical thinking. You know, you can sometimes feel him venturing out um, in sometimes on a sentence, you know, a long and complex sentence where the uh, where the subordinate clauses pile up on you and think, where is this going? And he must have felt something like the same, you know, is this going to come anywhere close to what I, in some sense, intended to say, but I'm also discovering that I want to say as I go along. I think you're muted. I am unmuted now. All oh, right, okay. Well, thank you for asking me to read. This poem is called Splinter. And that starts with a quote from Dwarf Fruit in Minimum Moralia. And the quote is, the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass. So here's the poem. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. No shard so small, it leaves the optic clear. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Your views are error prone, but truth can't lie. Sight lines locate obstructions far or near. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Light bends at speed, 
but these it can't get by. Wave blockers, moat or beam that interfere. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Thoughts, optics tell us certain laws apply. No room for pleading, just my viewpoint here. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Trust lenses crazed or cracked to show us why things aren't and cannot be as they appear. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Take your first test results and then retry the test with splinter plus good optics gear. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Those false beliefs you're eager to deny have their close analogue in vision sphere. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. For that's what best enables thought to vie, sight primed with ideology's false steer. Its truth distorted form they magnify. Let thought find out where sight lines went awry and vision compensate where mind tracks veer. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Its truth's distorted form they magnify. Thanks. I'll read one about Hegel. And um, Adorno had this um, very intense um, relationship, almost like sort of Harold Bloom, you know, the anxiety of influence. Um, he was, um, wh whenever he comes across an attack on Hegel, be it by an analytic philosopher or continental, he, he fires up in Hegel's defence and says, you know, all thinking that's worth anything, politically or intellectually, is dialectical thinking. And we owe to Hegel the first great sort of systematic articulation of that. And yet, um, whenever he reads Hegel, um, you know, he's constantly saying, but he's full of positives. He's full of these premature, positive, hopeful, um, sort of large scale, historical, sweeping, um, end directed teleologies. Yeah, but... Um, yeah, so it's, and yes, I mean, he, he wrote a book called Four Essays on Hegel, where he, he attacks those who attack Hegel for, for um, yeah, often said, you know, that Hegel's style is uh, sort of lumpish and coagulated and uh, top heavy and clumsy and so forth. And uh, he says there what he says in defense of his own, Adorno's own writing, you know, things are tough, things are difficult and complicated, and your writing is going to have to be tough, difficult, complicated, and if you want an easy read, don't read Hegel, but then, you know, what purpose does it, would you have, why would you want to do an easy read? So that, that's what um, you get in this poem. Um, it's called, the poem is called Hegel and the Robot Bombs, um, and you'll see why it has that rather strange title. Um, and the passage that, that um, inspired it is from a section of the of Minimum Realia called Out of, the, uh, Out of the Firing Line, where Adorno says, had Hegel's philosophy of history embraced this age, Hitler's robot bombs would have found their place beside the early death of Alexander and similar images as one of the selected empirical facts by which the state of the world's spirit manifests itself directly in symbols. Quote, I have seen the world's spirit, unquote, not on horseback, but on wings and without a head. And that refutes at the same stroke Hegel's philosophy of history. Uh, so the robot bomb, this mad careering, careening, wild, totally inaccurate, hugely destructive thing that was filling the skies in this country at the time um, is a kind of um, emblem, you know, a kind of anti-Alexander the Great, <laughs> you know, this um, sheer imbecility careering through the sky. So the poem, um, Acephalus, the robot bomb pursues a course predestined, bang on target, sent careering blindly as our instrument of choice, if it's apocalypse we choose. The zeitgeist gone long ways around and spent whole epochs seeking out new ways to use its hidden hand and turn the techno screws on any counter plan we might invent. The Hegel yarn had world historic news and big ideas as backup. Stuff that lent some credence to its onward upward bent, with just the odd step backwards to excuse. Then came the bombs, and talk of progress went clean off the tracks, along with every ruse in reason's book that told us, don't ask who's in line for their next shattering descent. Let's have the dialectic pay its dues to hopes negated, and the discontent of optimists who live on to repent they're making light of history's jacques. Let's not deny they're truly excellent, those robot bombs, 
if what you have in view is the lethal kind of progress that accrues from techno warriors in their element. For then it's every human scale you lose or every impulse that might orient your feelings in a mode more sentient for what it means to stand in other's shoes. There's one more section, which is not complete. I must have left uh, page four. Well, I'll read you part of it anyway. Uh, oh, here it is. No. V1s and V2s in a mad career, projectiles dead on course yet flying blind, are supplements to Hegel that remind the chronicler how world events may veer far wide of reason's governance and find how prone the skittish zeitgeist is to jeer at all its sage predictions or to steer a course that leaves all compass points behind. Like youthful Alexander on his bier, fate's victim shorn of triumphs pre-assigned by destiny, so too these missiles bind their victims tight within a technosphere where expertise and idiocy unwind the mock prophetic threads that tell us we are what's left as mind and sentience disappear and the bombs fall robotically aligned. So yeah, there is another half page of that, but I couldn't find the page. Um, yeah, um, this uh, this relates to Adorno's style. Um, the fact that he writes um, in a way that involves the reader very heavily in making sense of what uh, what is written. Um, it connects with um, um, a school of literary criticism, mainly German school, um, um, where the idea is that um, as the novel perhaps all literature, but the novel especially, as it progresses, becomes more sophisticated as time moves on. So the reader is left with more work to do. And that includes gaps. It includes um, places where the author has not obligingly presented all details that are needed to make sense of the novel. In other words, there's more interpretive investment on the reader's part, uh, to the point where um, the reader is, is doing a lot of the creative work in order to, to eke out, if you like, or to supplement what the author's provided. Um, Adorno had something like the same attitude, you know, he thought that thinking, um, really rigorous thinking was gappy, it wasn't smooth and finished and systematic and um, perfectly formed. So this is called gaps. And the passage from Minima Moralia says, um, anyone who died old and in the consciousness of a seemingly blameless success would secretly be the model schoolboy who reels off all life stages without gaps or omissions an invisible satchel on his back. And the poem, one mark of a well-crafted text, the gaps. Leave no loose ends, let every link show plain, a schoolboy rule, enforce lest they should lapse from drilled routine to thought, the teacher's bane. There are unmarked spaces on our mental maps, anomalies that tell us think again, or sudden jolts that caution us, perhaps our mental tracks are what derailed the train. How often it's a trite conclusion caps some stretch of reasoning eager to maintain the rule, link up, avoid all booby traps and keep conjecture on the tightest rein. Totality is the monstrous beast that wraps its grubby paws around the teeming brain. While thought disrupted fashions from the scraps new linkages at each point in the chain. Let paradox abound so thinking taps unknown resources, strikes a tangent plane or stretches logic's tether till it snaps and cuts across the rule conformist brain. Don't say, Adorno, give that stuff a rest, quit theorizing, life's too short to waste on running life experience past a test no real world operator ever faced. Those textual gaps are everything repressed, struck out, distorted, edited, displaced, redacted, yet obliquely self-confessed in lifelines by a skillful linesman traced. The true confessors say, make a clean breast of all your woes. Give someone else a taste of what you've gone through. Let the shrink digest whatever drives your psychic cut and paste. Yet it's those shrinks, the get it off your chest brigade, whose strikingly unfreudian haste for closure shows how deeply they are distressed by gaps of sense too large or oddly spaced. For there's no life so uniformly blessed or cursed that it's five act progressions graced like that of narcissists who manage best with text and lifelines smoothly interlaced. 
strict conscience says, the one maths lesson missed through sleeping in is one you won't get back in a whole life spent pondering its gist. So set the clock and cut yourself no slack. Too true. Yet time may teach the rigorist how much may come of lives that veer and tack, or greet the schoolboy as he takes a twist of truant wandering from the proper track. Your pupil who works dully through his list of tick box tasks may yet turn out to lack the gap strewn way around that yields a tryst with truth down errors seeming cul-de-sac. Blake's message, if the fool would but persist in folly, then the error toll might stack up high enough to vindicate the blissed out sleeper, not the kid with books to pack. Learn then from him, the bad recidivist schoolboy, how those content to take the flack may earn, along with some slaps on the wrist, some credit for the, their gap diviner's knack. Okay. Which of course is in minimum moralia. And the quote associated with this one, which is called Promise Me This, My Child, is amongst today's adept practitioners, the lie has long since lost its honest function of misinterpreting reality. Nobody believes anybody. Everyone is in the know. Lies are told only to convey to someone that one has no need either of him or his good opinion. So here's the poem. What happened to the good old lie, the kind the bourgeois told? As if to say, the rules apply, it's just that they're on hold. Back then, you got the thing to fly, that falsehood they'd been sold, in ways that kept the other guy within the human fold. The message went, let's not dis deny you fell for my fool's gold. Yet we matched wits before you'd buy, cajola and cajoled. Those bourgeois still met eye to eye. They knew the rules of old. They'd lie to you. They'd bleed you dry, but to keep you from the cold. What's changed is how the glacial freeze creeps on from day to day. Her speech turns icy by degrees as falsehood makes its way. For now, the dupe is one who sees straight through the games they play. Those types whose every line says, please don't trust a word I say. It's old style liars hide the keys to truth for fear that they might slip up when they shoot the breeze to keep the cold at bay. Now no one needs to tack and tease like predator and prey when post-truth adepts lie with ease and there's no price to pay. Let's not look back in fond regret, nor wish they'd come again. Those times when lies were ways to get one up, yet still maintain a semblance of the etiquette that bids us not disdain our dupes, because the trap we set turns out a precious bane. No call for such nostalgia, yet those lies required we feign some lingering grasp of untruth's debt to truth denied in vain. Now post-truth stalks the internet, that permafrost terrain, while truth becomes an empty threat in error's vast domain. There's those who'll say we'll pay the price, pay dearly in the end, when trust runs out and only ice can bind false friend to friend. Some straightforward lying might suffice, they say, to halt the trend and yield from that old-fashioned vice a new truth dividend. But those there are who warn, think twice before you re-extend lies old domain, lest, in a trice, you've no old truths to mend. For that's the snake in paradise, the ladder you descend, when arctic bounds grow imprecise, and lies with falsehoods blend. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I'll go back downstairs now. <laughs> <laughs>